Welcome back to The Nobody Zone, a podcast produced by RTE's Documentary on One in Ireland and Third Ear in Denmark. Before we begin, here's a letter we received sometime after the original podcast series went out. The letter came to us through the Irish chaplaincy in London, who are in contact with Irish prisoners in UK prisons. We put the word out that we wanted to hear from anyone who may have known Kieran Kelly in jail, and we received this reply. The text here is read by an actor. August 3rd, 2020, Her Majesty's Prison, Franklin, Durham. Kieran Kelly. I can't remember if I met him in Whitemoor or in Wakefield Prison. My mind has blocked on which prison I bumped into and forced. Or what can one say about him? The only way I can put it across to you is in this way. Over the many years inside prisons across the UK, I've met a few serial killers. One can group them into their own groups. First you have stage one killer. He's stone-faced with no facial expression and gives nothing away on what's going on inside with his thoughts. He's quiet and a loner. Doesn't mix with others and, and won't speak unless spoken to forced. One doesn't know where they stand with this kind of mental killer. And then you have the happy-go-lucky killer. Always on the move. Won't walk with others but likes to be heard. Laughs and jokes as it, as it gives him an audience. And this is how Mr Kelly lived his life inside all the prisons he was housed in. He needs people around him who he can control and use. Lives from day to day with no other thoughts for the next day, week, or month or year. No tomorrow, just today. The week will always be his target. But old school inmates like my seven others will tell him to jog on if he tries his head games with us. Serial killers are very hard people to get to know if you're not in their clique. It's very hard to put across what one can say is one will never know what's going on inside their heads. Messed up people with nothing to live for is what I can say about them. We left you last time with a promise that we'd found more answers and more questions in the story of Kieran Patrick Kelly. If you've not heard the previous seven episodes, I strongly recommend you stop here and hear them before you go on. Who did he murder or are you a spy? I'm just fond of a drink, helps me laugh, helps me cry. No, but just drink red biddy for a permanent high. I laugh a lot less, I cry till I die. Kieran Kelly died in Franklin Prison back in 2001. Franklin Prison houses many of the most dangerous criminals in the UK. The Yorkshire Ripper Peter Sutcliffe was an inmate. The so-called Dr Death serial killer Harold Shipman was there. And many, many more. The letter you heard at the beginning of the programme was the first of two. The man who wrote it, who we can't name, has himself been incarcerated in prison long enough to have run into Kelly more than once. After we received the first letter, we wrote back and asked if he could remember anything else about Kelly. And in October this year, we received this reply. October 11th, 2020, Her Majesty's Prison Franklin, Durham. Right, about Mr Kelly. Ke- Kelly would run up to others and stand in front of them before speaking of them putting fear into others because of his crimes. I first met him at the start of the 1990s in HMP Wakefield. He was pointed out to me by another Irish inmate, and the only time I met or or seen him was on the way or back from workshops. I also bumped into him at the weekends at the football field. I did notice that most of the times I did see him, he was on his own. I did not know about his crimes until being told by other inmates who warned me about him. They called him a nutter. Last time I seen him, his hair was starting to turn grey. I only found out about his death here at Franklin when his name popped up one day when I was having a talk with another inmate at the workshop. 
That letter describes the end of Kieran Kelly's life. A hardened lifer, inside with two life convictions. Kelly seemed keen to spread the word around Franklin that he was a dangerous serial killer. Our search for people who may have encountered Kelly during prison time took a more surprising turn when the man who'd actually signed him into jail in 1983 also got in touch. This is retired prison officer Joseph Tyler. I joined the prison service in 1982. Now living in Ireland, Joseph was listening to the radio when RTE broadcast The Nobody's Own back in March. His ears suddenly pricked up when he heard who the story was about. I heard that programme, I thought, blowing hell, I thought, God, I couldn't believe it, you know, because Kieran Kelly. Kieran Kelly was a name he remembered, because Kieran Kelly was in Brixton Prison while he was on remand and during the time he was on trial back in 1983. His face is still sort of there in my memory and how it sticks out after all those years. Joseph worked at Brixton, receiving new prisoners and getting them registered and so on. It was a Saturday afternoon and we, what we used to do, we'd take in prisoners from the police in the morning locate them after we'd strip search them and taken, you know, all the processions away, all locked up, all signed. And the governor walked into the reception and he said to me, can you come to the gate with me? We've got a prisoner coming in from the police. The prisoner they were expecting that day was a so-called Cat A or Category A prisoner, the category reserved for the most serious and dangerous criminals. And this one was expected to be a big fish, a multiple murderer. Special delivery, directly from the police with blue lights flashing. A man who'd murdered another man in the police cells. So, the prison governor himself gets Joseph to come along and take care of things. But to their surprise, the man the police dropped off was someone they already knew. Kieran Kelly. And he just said, hello, Gov. You know, that's what they say. Hello, Gov. The governor, he was shaking his head because he knew Kelly. And he said, what have you done? What have you been up to? And he, he you know, it was quite funny, really, because he was, he was telling us what he'd done, you know, pushed him under the train, and, and he was, you know, just rattling on about it, and, and I couldn't believe it because he didn't look capable, you know. The list of murders that he had quoted, he was saying there he'd, you know, murdered so-and-so and so-and-so, and, so and, so, and I can't remember it individually, but he just kept on talking about who and where he had done it, just blurted it out. The fact that the governor of Brixton Prison knew Kelly so well and was so surprised to see the little man with the big nose suddenly admitting to multiple murders is down to the fact that Kelly was a regular. He'd been in and out of London prisons for years and in fact he'd only recently been released from Brixton after his trial for the attempted murder of a man called Francis Taylor. I know it's hard to keep up with all the names and dates in the Nobody's Own, but Francis Taylor was a man who was pushed in front of a train by Kelly in August 1982. He survived, but Kelly was charged with attempted murder. The charges were eventually dropped and Kelly was released. Previous to that, and here's another thing about why the governor never really thought of Kelly as much of a killer, He'd also been in Brixton because he'd been put inside for stealing 10 pints of milk. After he got out for that, he was arrested yet again for pushing another man, Jock Gordon this time, at Oval Station on the underground. Jock Gordon had also survived unscathed and the charges again were dropped in that case. Kelly had only been out of prison just a few weeks before the day he went to Clapham Common, attacked a pensioner and stole his ring and got arrested yet again. 
Then and only then, when Kelly murdered William Boyd by strangling him with his socks, did the confessions begin and the charges finally stuck. He, he was at Brixton and he was quite well known, but he was never in any trouble. He just was firing about and that, you know, and just sort of, just, he was like a flyweight, a little tiny man. And uh, meeting with him that night, something that I've never forgotten. The picture of Kieran Kelly waltzing back into prison with the cheery, hello, gov, fits very well with the man Ian Brown remembers from the interviews at the time. As Ian Brown pointed out previously in this podcast, prison was just part of the routine for Kelly. I think it went through his mind, you know, having a bed every night and a pillow and a blanket and a mattress and food ain't going to be such a bad thing. It's actually a big improvement on what I've got now. And I think it was, you know, some of it was relief that I'm going somewhere safe. We've said a few times during the series that the men and women who inhabited the nobody zone were the kind of people no one really missed and that no one really cared about. But the next person who got in touch with us after hearing the podcast actually did care. My name is Anna and I'm a nurse. This is Anna Dillon. Who presently working in Cork but has worked in the past in South London during the 1980s. Anna is now clinical nurse manager at the clinical decision unit in the emergency department of Cork University Hospital. Just like Joseph Tyler, Anna also had to stop up and listen when she heard mention of Kieran Kelly's name on the radio. Because that was a name that was often spoken about back in the 1980s when Anna was a nurse working in St George's Hospital in Tooting, South London. The reason I contacted the show was because it brought back a a huge amount of memories for me, things that I, uh, this is well over 30 years ago, that I had actually forgotten about and that brought back a whole part of my own life history and journey at that time in London. At that time in London, Anna worked closely with the homeless, the people who knew Kelly. The nosy Kelly would have been obviously what he was referred to in the documentary, but, like, the boys used to call him Psycho. They used to say he was Psycho Kelly. And that's the way they refer to him on the street. And I hope, don't mean to offend anybody by saying that, but that's, that's they refer to him as that. The boys Anna's referring to were the predominantly Irish homeless men she treated on a daily basis at the hospital, together with her colleagues who took it upon themselves to make sure they had a safe place to come and get medical treatment, to offer a familiar voice to talk to, sometimes even a shoulder to cry on. Anna and nurses like her were a very rare source of kindness and compassion in the tough lives of these rough sleepers. Anna was moved to get in touch with us because of one man in particular. There was one particular guy, and his name was uh, Noel Logan. He was an amputee. And I was standing in my kitchen and I was listening to the show as it went on and I thought, oh, my God, all those years of disbelieving Logan. All those years of disbelieving Logan. Because Logan told her what Kieran Kelly had done to him. I was kind of going, you know, putting him in the bath or in the shower and cleaning him and what happened to your leg, Noel? How'd you lose the leg? Psycho Kelly shoved me under under the train. I couldn't get to the end of the platform fast enough. He remember going under the train and waking up minus his leg. Logan didn't just mention this once. It was a story he told consistently, over and over again, over many years. I said it to my colleagues and they said, no, no, he's only making that up, that's all. And he said, that's the drink. But no, he was very adamant. He was absolutely adamant that that Nosey Kelly shoved him under the train. And every new nurse that had come along, a new doctor had come along, they'd all get the same story. So do you know the way something 
kind of, you just go, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, so everyone was, is that true? No, I don't think so. Anna felt her heart sink when she heard about Kieran Kelly on the Nobody's Own. And I felt so bad for Logan that I had, you know, hadn't believed him, even though we always looked after him really well and made sure that he was OK. And I couldn't, for the life of me, all these years, on, until that Sunday, understand why a guy would have jumped under the train, lost his leg, and, and like as if it were a suicide attempt, and still continue on life around tooting on crutches with one leg and uh, getting a new shoe every other week from whichever shoe shop put out the right shoes, the right foot shoes. One-legged Noel Logan, a familiar face on the streets around Tooting in South London, known along the high street for stealing single right-foot shoes from shoe shop displays, and much loved by the nurses at St George's, where, as an amputee, he was a regular client. Noel was a rogue. A rogue. Even when he was drunk, he was a rogue. You couldn't but love him. We had a huge affection and a soft spot for Logan over all of them. And that's why the, he's the one that stood out in my mind. Very intelligent man. Noel always got fresh clothes and a bath and we'd bring in clothes from home. I had an awful argument with him one day. He was being really you now a bit belligerent and it came to harsh words. So I told him, clear, get out. And I said, when you're coming back the next time, I said, Logan, you better bring the roses, right? And about two or three days later, he arrives back apologising with a big bunch of flowers that he robbed out of someone's garden up the road. And you kind of go, what do you say? He was a good soul, though. But hes that's the reason why I contacted you. I'm sorry, Noel, that I didn't believe you. Very sorry. Kelly didn't mention Logan on his confession tape. And Logan's story about being pushed under a train by Kelly doesn't appear anywhere on Kelly's long rap sheet. He would have been charged with attempted murder for that one. But then, none of this is altogether surprising. The Irish homeless didn't expect much from the police in London in those days, other than a possible beating, according to Anna Dillon. So they usually just avoided them at all costs. Logan never laid charges. Nobody at the hospital thought to do so either on his behalf because nobody believed him. In the nobody's own, things just flew under the radar. But Anna Dillon did know about Kelly. She heard about him often. I never met him, but I knew all about him. In fact, a lot of people knew about Kelly. The one she said the boys called Psycho. They used to say, like, you'd feel him before you'd see him. They knew he was in the vicinity. But they all were afraid of him. It wasn't just the other homeless who avoided Kieran Kelly. His picture was pinned up on the wall inside the hospital itself. We had a spreadsheet of troublemakers, people who caused trouble or who were a danger to us, photographs, mugshots of people... And he was on it, and a number of others, like, of other nationalities were on it as well, as well as mental health patients, that when they came in, they would be a threat to us as staff. Anna recalls that Kelly's face was on top of that list even long after he'd been sent to prison, just in case. It came across very well in the documentary that, you know, the guy in the cell was snoring and it irritated him, so he went for him. And that was basically... If something irritated him, he went for them. And he needn't have been drunk for that. So he seemed to have been that kind of um, schizoid personality kind of thing. He could flip like that. He was known for that. The people who knew him, sadly, are not with us, my nursing colleagues, and they would have been the ones that would have been able to tell you a whole lot more. But I do know one thing, they didn't like him. And I think it was the only one of the lads they didn't like. He just wasn't a nice person. Anna also recalls a significant drop in injuries showing up at the emergency room after Kelly's arrest. A um, load of people used to come in, beaten up and brought into hospital. And they'd say it was Kelly. 
after he went to prison, all that, that kind of, it just seemed to stop. It was more, they were what we used to call PFO, pissed fell over, we were seeing after that. Anna remembers the fallout of London's Nobody Zone from her own experiences there. The desperation and the hopelessness that it caused. I learned an understanding of life on the streets, living homeless from that period in London and from learning from Noel Logan and the rest of the lads. And the dangers that they um, faced every day and the strategies they put in place. And they're no different now than they were then, but I have an understanding of it. Thanks to no Logan and Nosy Kelly and all the lads that we looked after in South London in the 80s and 90s. Finding contemporaries of Kieran Kelly who would have actually lived on the streets of London when he was around proved to be a difficult task. Men like Noel Logan did not live into old age. But journalist Robert Mulhern did manage to meet up with author John Healy. John Healy's autobiographical book, The Grass Arena, which has since been made into a film, was based on his time as a homeless alcoholic, living rough on the streets of London in the 1960s and 70s. John Healy is what you might call the real deal. And while Healy never met Kelly in person, he is without doubt an expert witness in the nobody's own. The way I am, I'm the sort of expert who's written the book on this sort of um, thing so I can qualify Kelly. Rob and Healy went for a walk on Clapham Common, one of Kelly's old haunts, and Rob kicked off by asking about the violence inherent in the lifestyle. Did violence, was violence the overriding kind of uh, equaliser? Yeah, it was a currency. It, it, was, it was always there ready to erupt. They were paranoid. The police were corrupt. The police would fit you up with anything, beat you up. So there was paranoia. So then when the drink kicked in, and it was bad drink, cheapest rock gut stuff that drive you crazy, they would, um, it, it flared things up more. The, if it really got out of hand, it'd be broken bottles that would be used. You'd be faced with a broken bottle. Yeah. Were you ever in that situation? You were? I was, yeah. Yeah, I was often in that situation. Yeah, I got uh, a bottle stabbed at my face, at my eye, and I split my finger down there. I put, I put my hand up, see? And that knuckle there. See how it's come back from punching. John Healy bears the scars of a life on the streets. What he calls in his book, A Life in the Wino Jungle. It's a life that nearly always began with the bottle. There are many different routes to uh, ending up in a, a wino jungle, but they all involved drink. In, in them days, there was, uh, it was illegal to drink on the streets, so you would be herded into parks or out of the way places, disused graveyards. So, I mean, to call them parks is being uh, very polite. You couldn't just walk in, there was a you had to have a, a pass, and the pass would be money or alcohol. But they had to leave the park during the day to commit petty crime to get the money for the drink. So they'd need to try shoplifting or, or mugging or whatever. Well, uh, if a mugging goes wrong, it can turn into a murder. Uh, the term for them was predatory felons. Your man Kelly, he, he would have come under that, and uh, as far as I can see, the term would have been correct for him. <laughs> Healy explained one of the dubious advantages of the homeless life. That meant avoiding prosecution was sometimes relatively easy. If they arrested you for that, they wouldn't know who you were. You could give any name. They wouldn't have your fingerprints. They, if they sent your fingerprint, they couldn't just mess around It'd take days or a week to come back with the fingerprints. They wouldn't know who you were. You could give them any name you liked. And so a man like Kelly, moving around all over the place, they wouldn't know who he was. You wouldn't know if why know if why knows if it was their real name or a non-diplume because uh, they'd be Scotch Jack or 
Irish Jim or Cockney Fred or uh, Maltese John, but you never knew their first names or really their last names or their story. And even if they told you a story, it probably would be all lies. I mean, I've done it myself. And you go to court and I give them Paul Newman once and they believed it, you know. In the last episode, we met Detective Superintendent Gary Richardson from the British Transport Police. And we heard that interested parties had contacted the inquiry he ran, looking for answers in connection with the deaths of loved ones on the London Underground in the 60s, 70s and 80s. Deaths usually recorded as suicides or accidents. The suicides in particular raised big concerns, of course, because families simply couldn't accept that explanation sometimes. But accidents were also hard to understand or believe, that people just fall in front of oncoming trains. Since the podcast went out, this same concern led to a number of people getting in touch with us. Now, to be clear, all we do know is that Kelly did push some people in front of trains. It was part of what he did. We know now that there were at least three, two of which he was charged with, Taylor and Jock Gordon. And now we know about the testimony of Noel Logan. But the question is, are there more? He was found on, under attack. He was killed under attack in the St. Tank investigation in, in London. He, I don't know about you down and out. He was found at the drink, we know. But what the London police said was they don't know was he pushed or did he fall. And it just kind of struck me. His name was Peter Kelly from Galway. My grandmother called him Gulls. But he was definitely under the train in, in St. Pancras Station. Mm. I was just wondering, is there any list of names? This caller was asking if a man called Peter Kelly from Galway was on any sort of list. We had a few inquiries of this sort, but there was just no way we could track any of them down or verify them. The names we were given certainly did not figure on any of the lists we had connected to Kelly. And we can't connect Kieran Kelly to every death that happened on the underground just because we know he pushed three people. We did find a case that did point towards Kieran Kelly, but this case had a very different character. It happened 12 days after Kelly had murdered Hector Fisher on Clapham Common. Here's Kelly talking about that on the interview tape back in 1983. All right. I want to, go, to move on now and talk about Fisher. Would you tell me again how you did him? I did him a well up. And I, I, I cut him. I, I don't think there were stamps. I'm not sure. But I cut his bulks. But... How many times did you stab him? I don't know. I, was, I, I had a good drink on me. And what did you hit him on the head with? With a, with a, with a fucking big thing you had in your hand. A big thing you had in your hand? The, the handle of the big blade. The handle of the big blade. It was a heavy. One detail of that crime that sticks out is that Kelly said he had cut his hand when he used a sharp weapon on Fisher. How many times did you hit him on the head? I hit him once and then I hit him again, but I missed him. I hurt me on the second time. Twelve days after the Fisher killing, a 17-year-old girl, Wendy Hall, was attacked by what the newspapers later described as a knife-wielding madman. She was brutally attacked on an overground train coming into Tooting Station. In South London. Note, tooting again. Her assailant attacked her, stabbing her wildly with a knife around the neck, the same kind of stabbing that had killed Hector Fisher. As the train pulled into the station, she jumped out and collapsed on the platform and didn't see if her attacker had stayed on the train or jumped off. But she did say that the man who attacked her had a bandaged hand. In the newspapers at the time, Scotland Yard appealed to the public for help to find Hall's attacker. 
they said they were looking for a possible link between the attacks on Hall and Fisher. In fact, there had also been yet another stabbing attack on Clapham Common that happened between Fisher and the attack on Wendy Hall. This is a report written in the Daily Mirror on the 8th of August, 1975, under the headline, In the Shadow of a Mad Knife Killer. It reads as follows. Two other recent stabbings bear his hallmark. Three weeks ago, pensioner Hector Fisher was stabbed to death in a churchyard at Wandsworth. That's actually wrong. He was stabbed on Clapham Common. But anyway, I'll continue. And last week, 41-year-old William McSweeney was seriously hurt by a knife man at Clapham. A senior detective said, These attacks may all have been the work of one man who's been affected by the long spell of hot weather. He must be caught before there are more victims. No one was ever arrested for the attack on Wendy Hall, and Kelly was never charged with the killing of Fisher until eight years later. It was at that time that police showed a picture of Kieran Kelly to the now 25-year-old Wendy Hall for identification, but she failed to identify Kelly. In fact, she maintained that her attacker was a tall man with light-coloured hair. She made no mention of a big nose or anything like that. There was also a police artist's impression made at the time of the attack based on her description, but it bears no resemblance at all to Kelly. The case of the stabbing against Wendy Hall remained unsolved. So let's move on, because it's time to tell the story of a woman called Kitty Kelly. No relation. Back in March of this year, when the podcast was still underway, we recorded a phone conversation with a woman called Elisa Upchurch. Elisa is talking to Liam O'Brien from the Dock on One team here. The the, the lady in question is Kitty, who'd be your grandmother. Yeah, Catherine. Catherine uh, Kelly. We found Elisa through a family member, that had posted online about the Nobody's Own podcast. We found out that Elisa had been in touch with the British Transport Police back in 2015 when the story first hit the headlines. But the British Transport Police had never gotten back to her. So we got in touch. Elisa was concerned about her grandmother, Catherine or Kitty Kelly, who'd come over to London while Elisa's mother was pregnant with her. So she was over in London helping my mum, basically, because my mum was pregnant with me, obviously. And she was going down to the church for the day, which was St George's Cathedral. And so she went to Kennington Tube Station to get the tube. It was like one stop away, I think. And, yeah, she always we heard that was... Um, they said she either jumped or she was pulled, pushed or she fell onto the track. Elisa had heard the story going round the papers about Kieran Kelly back in 2015, and it struck a chord, mostly because of where her grandmother had died. But then when I heard that he was pushing people onto the tracks of that line, the Northern Line, which is Kennington Tube Station. Kennington Tube Station was a place we know Kelly often frequented. All the stations up and down the South London section of the Northern Line, Oval, Kennington, Clapham, Tooting, feature in this story as regular haunts of Kelly. Anna Dillon confirmed that the lads on the street never knew where he was going to show up, but it was always along the northern line. You might be able to remember the churchyard murder of Ed Toll, which Kelly was tried and acquitted for. That happened in a churchyard at Kennington. Mickey Dunn, who he claimed to have poisoned, died at Tooting, Francis Taylor, who he pushed onto the tracks, he pushed at Tooting. And Jock Gordon was pushed by Kelly just a few stops away at Oval Station. Elisa's mother never believed for one minute that Kitty's death could have been suicide. It just didn't make any sense. Kitty had been on her way to Mass at St George's Cathedral on an ordinary Monday morning. Yeah, she was a typical old... uh... Irish lady, devoted religious Catholic lady, you know. That's why we know she would never have jumped. Never. Not leaving my mum in the situation she was in as well. She'd never even dreamed of that. She wasn't in a, in a frame of mind to do that sort of thing. She was there to help me mum. 
There was another detail that never made sense to the family, too. Witnesses. And they also said to my mum there was witnesses, and one of them was, was a relative. My mum couldn't figure out who, would, who this relative was, because she was on her own. And it weren't until later on that we found out, like, I, I assumed and put that together, because his name was Kelly also, wasn't it, the guy, this um, Jim and Kelly. We know that Kelly did sometimes hang around the scene of a crime. So the police could possibly have talked to him at the time and written his name down, and then just assumed that he was related, same name. Elisa suggested this to the police back in 2015. When I spoke to the police, they all said, like, he couldn't have done it, he wasn't in the area at the time, and, and stuff like that. And then I spoke to another guy that said, uh, well, there is possibilities that he could have done it. Um, we're not going to say yes and we're not going to say no. One thing, however, speaks strongly against Kelly being involved here. The fact that he should have been locked up at this time. I've since learned that apparently he was in Broadmoor yeah, he, at the time. Yeah, I mean... So we're, we're, that, that's brought more, even more confusion to the situation. We talked about Kelly's time in Broadmoor back in episode four. Kelly had committed an aggravated robbery, forcing his way into a house in South London with a knife in 1969. He was committed under the Mental Health Act and spent two years at Broadmoor before they let him go. Now this ought to rule him out until you consider two things. Number one, at that time, Inmates of Broadmoor Psychiatric Hospital could, relatively easily, it turns out, be granted day or weekend release time. They were simply allowed out sometimes. This was something that caused a huge stir in the 1970s, as the whole system seemed to be fairly arbitrary, and a number of inmates ended up committing violent crimes while they were on short-term release from Broadmoor. So the practice was eventually stopped. But this brings us to the second thing, the date on which Kitty Kelly died. March 16th, 1970. It's a strange coincidence because um, March 16th, the, the day that your, your nan died, that's also, that's also the, say, the, the birth date of Kieran Kelly. Oh, really? So, Kieran Kelly would be 90 years old today if he was still alive. Jesus. That's, that's creepy, isn't it? That's really creepy. So, wow. March 16th, 1970, was Kieran Kelly's 40th birthday. Could Kelly have been on a weekend pass from Broadmoor, set free to celebrate his 40th birthday? There are no records anyone can access from Broadmoor. They're not public. Even if a record of this kind of temporary release was ever kept. Could Kieran Kelly have bumped into Kitty Kelly, a kind and helpful woman, just the sort of person who might lend a helping hand to someone in trouble, down on the tube at Kennington? Did they strike up a conversation? Kitty Kelly was from Dublin, a familiar accent, perhaps. I'm assuming that he would have spoken to her or something. Do you get what I mean? Because he heard her accent and she was Irish, maybe. I don't know. Elisa doesn't know what happened. The police don't know what happened, and neither do we. In the last episode, you might remember when we were looking for files on Christy Smith, we discovered that many of the coroner's records from this period have been destroyed. We searched for Kitty Kelly's coroner's report and confirmed that those files no longer exist. So we'll never know if Kieran Kelly's name was included as a witness to Kitty Kelly's death at Kennington Tube Station. Which means that there's practically zero chance of ever finding out exactly what happened down on Kennington Tube Station that day, 50 years ago. We don't know what happened to her. And we'd like to know what happened to her, but... You know, I'd like to know if he did or if he didn't, do you know what I mean? Because it's not nice not knowing what happened to her. Because my mum never, my mum always questioned what happened, do you know what I mean? She was very upset by it, I mean, 
she took years, like years to get over that, my mum. Because she always thought something wasn't right, you know? Something wasn't right. The whole Broadmoor episode is maybe the most telling part of the whole tragedy behind the Kieran Kelly story. After everything we've heard during this series about Kelly's behaviour, his wild temper, his crimes, his drinking, the way he preyed on vulnerable people around him, everything points to something I really don't think anyone needs to be a psychiatrist to figure out. Kieran Kelly had serious mental health issues, very serious. He was a danger to society and even a danger to himself for most of his adult life. So why did doctors at the Broadmoor High Security Psychiatric Hospital ever let him out? Robert Mulhern called up Kelly's former solicitor, John Slater, because he remembered him mentioning something about Broadmoor. I think he was in Broadmoor for an assessment, wasn't he? Yeah, but he, he was in and out of there for um, at different periods and, and obviously... But my recollection is that Broadmoor refused his admission to him on the basis he was penally incorrigible and medically untreatable. Really? Yeah. Yeah, that's... But uh, I'll always recall that because I'm mean, to be refused admission to Broadmoor on that basis. And how would... What does that mean in layman's terms? Well, it means that... I mean, Broadmoor's a hospital. So it's to treat people who've got mental illness and have committed crimes. And... I mean, the doctor came to the conclusion that he was medically untreatable. So the system simply didn't want him around. He was sent back onto the streets for the police to deal with. Our journey into the nobody zone has to end now. That's all the new information that's come to us since the podcast went out. There's no doubt more to discover, but we have to stop soon. But just before we do, Robert Mulhern got back in touch with retired Detective Superintendent Ian Brown, just for one last time, to put a few last questions to him in the light of everything that's been talked about in this series and everything we've discovered since. Rob really just wanted to ask him if, in the light of what we now know, he would have done anything different. If you knew then what I've given you now, say, in relation to Smith, even, and some of these other cases, do you think it would have changed anything at the time? Had I have had that at that time, the records that we would have needed would be fresh. I might well have got records from Broadmoor uh, to know whether he was out on, that, on his birthday. Then that's another one that would have been chased to the nth degree. But was it the case that the reason he tied off the Kelly case when he did and how he did was because there wasn't a commitment to provide further resources to go and follow up his other admissions. So, is that right? <laughs> no, I don't think, think that's absolutely right. What I think is that once you've got a conviction which sends somebody away for life, other than clearing it up for the benefit of the relatives and that... There isn't the same incentive to chase another 10, 20, 50 murders, whatever it is, and you rely on the, the logic of probability. So almost certainly he committed that murder, but do we need to prove it? Do we need to spend lots and lots of resources to prove a murder that isn't going to benefit us or anybody? It becomes a matter of manpower, and... But I have to mark this with you, like this might come across as being unpalatable now if I was to put my kind of critical hat and take a contrary view of the investigation. I might say, well, take Dennis Nielsen, another prolific British serial killer. Would the investigation team have just stopped at two or three there when they, they actually kind of got... They did. They stopped at a certain point. There was certainly one murder that could definitely have been proved... And they actually turned round to the wife and said, well, I'm sorry about that, love, but the indictment's already written up. We, we won't be pursuing that one. So, again, you're going back to that, that, those days. I mean, the flack that those 
detectives got for trying to prove one more and one more and one more. They were told repeatedly, we've run out of money, you can't do any more. You've got seven, why go for eight? It's enough. And whether it's right or wrong, that is the fact of policing in those days. With the Yorkshire Ripper, they would have, it would have been, wouldn't have been the case that they would have stopped with the attacks there. Yeah, but you're talking, uh, all right, you go to the Yorkshire Ripper. What you're talking about in the Yorkshire Ripper, the Yorkshire Ripper was a complete mess because there were no computers connecting each station. So stations next door to each other were investigating murders and not talking to each other. The Yorkshire Ripper should have been stopped ages before because there was all the information was there, but one bit was in one police station, one bit was in another, and one bit was in another. Had they have been put together, they'd have said, oh, there you go, this is car number so-and-so, and that's who's doing it. The one, the one thing you cannot do is to judge 30 years ago by today's standards. Like someone who might have listened to one to six of the nobody zone, they've listened to our conversations, the, you know, the journey that we've been on to get, try and get a handle on the numbers game, how many did Kelly kill? You might think, OK, from the police point of view, there was an information deficit maybe in relation to Kelly's crimes, but then they might hear Anna Dillon's testimony from the hospital and say, well, hold on a minute, this is... Here's somebody saying that everybody in the entire hospital knew Kelly. His picture was on the wall. The dogs in the street knew it. How did the cops not know about Kelly's reign of terror around Tooting? And uh, you, you know something? We've got a situation now where we've got something in society where people are saying black lives matter. Perhaps back in those days we should have said, vagrants' lives matter. But they were left to their own devices. Just people left to their own devices. Just before this episode came out, in fact, just last week, we did talk to a living relative of Kieran Kelly, who did not want to take part in the programme or be named for reasons we fully understand. In our brief conversations, it was plain to hear that life around Kieran Kelly was hard for everyone, that his violence and his mental illness affected everyone close to him very badly indeed. And that's all we can say about it, really. So, a final word on the Kieran Kelly story? Well, we did not prove or attribute beyond doubt one single additional murder to Kelly's rap sheet. We did prove that he did not kill Christy Smith, even though he confessed to doing so. And we did find plenty of supporting evidence to suggest that Kelly was easily capable of committing many of the other murders he did confess to and which he was never tried for. And I think it's safe to say that we also found evidence that there might well have been more murders that he never spoke about. But we can't prove any of it. So right here, at the very end, is one ray of sunshine, you might say, in all the darkness. If you remember, in the previous episode, we met Christy Smith's surviving relatives, his brother Nick Smith and his sister-in-law, Lily Smith. We found out that Christy's parents had lost more than one of their children in tragic circumstances, not just Christy. So when amateur genealogist Damien O'Sullivan was busy tracing documents around the family, he found a sister of Christy and Nick Smith called Phyllis. Phyllis had had a twin sister who died as a baby, but Phyllis herself had married and moved to Kenya, where the family presumed she'd passed away because she's not been heard of for more than 60 years. Well, it turns out Phyllis is still alive. She's alive and well and living in the United Kingdom. The families have been put back in touch and they hope to meet up again as soon as they can. And so with that, it only remains for me to say thank you to all the people who have allowed us to interview them and everyone who's helped in the making of this podcast series. 
and of course, to you for listening. Goodbye. All you young people, now take my advice. Before crossing the ocean, you'd better think twice. Cause you can't live without love, without love alone. The proof's round the west end in the nobody's home. But the summer is fine, but the winter's a fridge. Wrapped up in old cardboard in the charity cross bridge. And they'll never go home now because of the shame. The Nobody Zone is written and narrated by Tim Hinman. Storyline and production is by Tim Hinman and Christer Molson. Original idea, research and recordings are by Robert Mulhern, Nicolene Greer and Liam O'Brien. With production assistance from Sarah Blake, Donal O'Hurley, Tim Desmond, Ronan Kelly and Michael Lawless. Special thanks to genealogist Damien O'Sullivan and historian Niall Murray. The letter from the prisoner in HMP Franklin was voiced by Joe Taylor. The title music is the song Missing You, performed by Christy Moore. Original music for the series is by Tim Hinman. Graphics, marketing and press by John Kilkenny, Laura Beatty, Amy O'Driscoll, Nigel Wheatley, Frederick Neilbo, Jilly McDonough, Ellen Leonard, Bren Murphy and Anna Joyce. Illustrations by Alex Williamson. The Nobody Zone is a collaboration between RTE's Documentary on One in Ireland and third year productions in Denmark. If you wish to join the social media conversation around this podcast, please use hashtag the nobody zone or visit rte.ie forward slash the nobody zone. And if you'd like to comment or share any information you might have on the story, we'd love to hear from you. Email us documentaries at rte.ie. Thanks for listening. <laughs>